Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Pre-Shift Podcast. My name is DJ and I'll be your host diving deep into what it takes to run great restaurant teams. Joining me on the show today is Chris Britt, Chief Operating Officer at Epic Brands. My name's Chris Britt, Chief Operating Officer, COO of Epic Brands and Agave and Rye. Chris has been around since the first location of Agave and Rye, and now the group boasts more than a thousand workers across dozens of locations and a few different concepts. We chat about how they've expanded while maintaining their core values, the other challenges in scaling that quickly, and the distinction between running a restaurant and operating business. This is a long one, but a good one, and I promise you if you stick around, you'll come away with some really valuable insights. As always, the Pre-Shift Podcast is brought to you by Seven Shifts, team management for restaurants. Chris, how are you, man? Doing well, doing well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Glad you could join us today. Excited. Anytime we can talk our lovely industry, it's a, it's a go for me. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'm just going to dive right in. So I understand you were part of um, Agave and Rye kind of from the very beginning. Can you tell me about your decision to join that team in the early days and what went into that? Yeah, it's crazy. We just celebrated our, our six-year anniversary in February um, from Congrats. our initial store. Thank you. And in, in Covington, Kentucky, I originally worked for our ownership group. We're still husband and wife, privately owned, Wayne Yvonne Sarber. I went to Ohio State back after high school in Columbus and degrees in sports business. Don't know how I ended up in this industry, but I had picked up a uh, bartending job, part-time restaurant called Oliver's in Columbus. And that's one that Wade and Yvonne had owned in addition to two other ones at that time. Quickly, within six months, I was GM of, of that restaurant. Um, and I've never left, never left this this fun and exciting and chaotic industry. But um, we had no clue what we were doing back then, right? We called those old co days. Um, you know, I think we had the mindset and Wade and Yvonne had the mindset of a lot of first time entrepreneurs when it comes to the industry where it's simple and easy. All you do is sell food and drinks and get guest pay and it's, and it's happy and not understanding all the ins and outs and the million variables that go into um, uh, a successful restaurant, as you know, you know, 60% fail in year one, 40% don't make it to year three. And we were part of those numbers back in Columbus at those, at that time. So Wayne Yvonne had a restaurant coach fly up from Austin, Texas. He said, you need to close or sell and start from scratch. So they um, sold Oliver's where I was GM and closed um, De Novo, which was our fine dining restaurant, both downtown. We've learned downtown markets are also difficult. But at that time, Yvonne had started working on the Agave and Rye concept and looking to move out of Columbus somewhere in the Cincinnati market. And they found this small 1,500 square foot corner restaurant across the river in Covington, Kentucky with boatload of debt, $1,200 to their name and an old U-Haul of restaurant equipment and artwork and started um, Agave and right there with a gigantic risk as a lot of owners would have just switched industries, right? But they kept it going. So um, I did not go with them initially. I stayed on at GM at Oliver's uh, in Columbus with the previous owner, but always stayed in contact with Yvonne throughout the day. She's kind of a second mother figure to me. She has a daughter the same age as myself. Um, so we have that familial familial bond. And, you know, when you trust and love and respect the people you work for, it makes difficult decisions. In this case of me moving from Columbus, where I lived for 12 years down to um, Kentucky. And I, we always laugh that, you know, I, I always say, you know, going to Kentucky to sell tacos and tequila is kind of sounded like an asinine idea. Um, <laughs> but clearly it's paid off. So that was the decision making on my end to come down there. Um, after, like I said, they opened in February. I came down in December. I came down after Christmas Eve um, of 2018 and took over um, GMing of that first restaurant there. And it's been um, a whirlwind, a positive whirlwind ever since. That's awesome. Um, you know, I know from a previous interview, um, you know, that first location was successful, but Given the past, uh, the owners, uh, Yvonne, and, uh, didn't really want to expand. You know, they wanted to stick to that one restaurant. But, um, you know, I read in the news now you've got over 100 locations of just agave and rye plant uh, in addition to being a multi-unit uh, restaurant group, Epic Brands. Um, what was the deciding factor in those early days? Like, let's actually go and expand this and, and see what it can become rather than just uh, kind of rest on that one location. Yeah, sure. And, and piggybacking off of what you said, you know, we owned – 
any given time in Columbus, five restaurants at one time, all different concepts, right? So I think the thought of expansion, um, and this is where a lot of restaurants go wrong, right, is the difficulty from just number one to number two is so severe and dramatic and has to be systemized. Um, So I think there was a little hesitation on doing that until we knew for sure we had something that was duplicatable, especially in, you know, a casual for full service restaurant. It's very difficult to to duplicate, unlike a QSR um, non-scratch kitchen model. But um, about 14 months in, we realized we had something special there um, and we took in a minimal outside um, investment to um, open that second location and part of our third. And we've self-funded ever since ever since then, which is um, great um, and rare. And now we've learned you can only self-fund so far. You need that working capital, that cash flow. So lessons learned um, throughout scalability. But um, yeah, we opened our second location in Lexington, Kentucky in June of um, 2019 and um, have been expanding ever since. The second location wasn't very busy and is still our least, um, you know, it's our lowest sales grossing restaurant currently. So that kind of gave a little pause as well. But then we did, once we opened our third location in, in greater Cincinnati, um, I transferred over to open that restaurant as as GM. And that's been our flagship location ever since and our number one um, grossing restaurant. And at that point, we knew we had a brand um, that could continue to scale and continue to be successful. And we sell things that you can't find anywhere else. We're not a commodity restaurant. It's an experience economy, experience hospitality. That's what we do. Our food is 100% scratch. You can't find it anywhere else. There's always imitators. And now everybody wants to do tacos, which is totally fine. Um, you know, tacos is, is our vessel that we do whatever we want into it. A lot of American cuisine. We're not Mexican. It's a misnomer because people think tequila and tacos is Mexican. We use a lot of the Mexican staples and turn them into a unique, innovative menu. And we win awards all the time for best tacos, most innovative menu. We just won both of those in Cincinnati, which is a huge market and a, a huge few, uh, food scene. So we're super proud of the team for doing that. Yeah, there's no end in sight. Obviously, we have, we just opened our 17th location in Cleveland, our second Cleveland location. We have one more scheduled this year in greater Cincinnati again. And then we have our steakhouse, SOB Steakhouse, um, our QSR model in Alabama called Trashy Dog. And we're opening a new concept in Grandview, which is Columbus, um, here in about a month called Loco Social, which is also a QSR um, model. So a lot of fun things um, that we've accomplished, but a lot of more fun, exciting things we want to do in the future. And we like to say um, we'll continue to be aggressive, but not reckless. Once we get reckless, that's where kind of um, the chaos no longer can be controlled. So um, yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, And congrats to all of that and and looking forward to to seeing what happens. But um, to get from that one location um, as a GM now to COO, um, of a multi-brand restaurant group. Um, I'm sure you've learned a lot along the way, and I, I want to tap into that. Um, but what does a typical day, what is a COO of a, of, a, of a multi-brand restaurant group? What are you responsible for, and, and what do your days look like? Yeah, sure. Um, and in my role, might not be atypical to other restaurant groups. I'm not quite sure. I do have a lot of connects, and as we grow, you know, we've been able to build our network, and I've been able to grow my network of resources and people within the industry, which is one of the great things because we all have that same passion and drive in our industry. We wouldn't be in it. But um, yeah, but like you mentioned, that transition from um, having worked every position in hospitality and in the restaurant business and have grown. And I've always been the second hand to our ownership group. So it's always been kind of Yvonne 1A, me 1B or 1-2 punch, right? Um, Yvonne, we're driven on founder's mindset and very entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial. Um, I'm probably more of the analytical, logistical, operational type of thing. So it's a great, I think that's a great successful brand. You always have those um, at the top to kind of bounce ideas off and and feedback. And um, we have a good relationship. We're not afraid to make the other person mad because we all have the same goal, right? To protect the brand and to protect our people and to scale the brand. So throughout that scalability process, and mind you, none of us have done this before in our group, right? 
Um, everyone that we've hired in has never worked for a large corporate um, entity or in, in the hospitality industry. So in regards to my days, they vary, right? That, you know, nowadays it's almost 75% probably behind a computer or behind a phone and 25% inside our restaurants. Um, you know, I, I love being inside our restaurants and you know, being kind of screen all day can get monotonous and, and sometimes you lose the perception or perspective of actually what's going on inside your four walls and interacting with the people and make sure the culture is still there. The morale is still there. It's a clean restaurant. The, the, the team's performing well, the food's food's consistent, but in regards to now, you know, I get up every morning, plethora of emails going through those. Most of them go into the spam folder, as I'm sure you can imagine, um, you know, checking our internal um, intranet, so to speak, on all of our, we, we require everybody to leave daily notes. Um, so checking all of our department heads notes and making sure it's my job to make sure I have that firm pulse, right, of what's happening throughout our brand, not just in the stores, but within the departments that kind of facilitate on how the stores operate. So, you know, now I have marketing reports to me, IT, store operations, um, culinary facilities, maintenance, purchasing, events and catering, um, and worked in, te- in tandem daily with finance and, and HR. So it's a, a large percentage of those departments um, and those directors that report to, directly to me. We did scale up our corporate, we call it Beehive, quite heavily for um, an anticipated faster growing um, scalability. But we've kind of made, we before we do that, kind of like I mentioned, we don't want to be reckless. We want to make sure we have the right people on the bus, right? Because we like to do the analogy, right? If you have one cog or if you're on an 18-wheeler that represents every department or whatever, and you have one flat tire or one that's running out of air, slows down the entire operation. So um, we've scaled that back a little bit and it's actually helped because now everybody's kind of more on that same seamless page, knowing where we're going um, and, and achieving the same, same goals. And so it's difficult because I also am responsible for day-to-day operations. I have a great regional director who kind of oversees the, the more micro part of that. I oversee more of the the macro, but then also focusing on strategic growth, concept development, and, you know, what the trends of the industry, where are we going, the crazy economy, the financials, the, you know, how to, you know, our numbers in line and communicating that down, top down, bottom up. And now we're probably 1200 deep, right? And in, in team members. So, so a lot different from that first store where there was 30, um, you know, so that's been a little challenging in essence, but I think we do a really good job. And, you know, we preach, you know, if we do these four things every day, right, hold it, hold each other accountable, over communicate with humility, right, throw the ego out of the, out of the window and then have fun, smile um, and, be, and be happy. Um, you know, good things happen. And if we can, we say TLC, train, lead and develop or coach and develop um, our leadership at the stores, because ultimately they're the most important people. I don't get to work in the stores every day. I'm not interacting with our guests. So it's up to that LOH leader of the house, which is our acronym for, for GM and his or her leadership team um, to facilitate our brand standards down, right? We like to create the framework for them to operate freely within um, to achieve brand standards and deliver on our promise, which is deliver an epic experience to our guests, team members, and community. And we have six, you know, 17, 18, 19 stores now. Sometimes I lose track. It's, it's difficult, very challenging, especially with three to four different concepts. And we like to, I was having a coaching conversation with our um, director of operational FP&A um, yesterday, Ryan, and, you know, having, you know, and he takes our financials in and helps communicate it down to the store level ops team. And he was a little frustrated. I'm like, well, you can't deliver the message the same to all 16 stores. It's no different than a GM having 16 different servers. The end goal is the same, provide that experience, right? But you have to facilitate and get to know the people on a human basis and know what makes them tick, what makes them um, have that motivation and inspiration and allow them to um, come up to the solution themselves instead of you giving them that, you giving them that solution and, um, 
and it's challenging for a lot for a lot of people. And um, but that's the exciting part of this industry is every day is a challenge, a new challenge, and then seeing the rewards and seeing people happy. Our team and our guests is what makes uh, us do what we continue to do. And that kind of goes in. Um, you know, I, I've heard you speak before about there's a difference between running a restaurant and operating a business. You know, is that kind of that distinction for you? Yeah, especially as you grow and scale, because when you have one, two, three, four, it's still kind of running a restaurant, um, right? That 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 mindset shift. John Maxwell has a book called Leader Shift, which is kind of appropriate, um, and and um, knowing how to, you know, that's the thing. Everybody that works in a restaurant currently, right? In our in our stores, probably most restaurants, right, can properly facilitate running a day to day shift. Everyone knows the opening procedures. Everybody knows what a server should be doing, a bartender, a cook, a food, the food, the drinks, providing that that service hospitality to to the guests. Right. That's kind of the the one oh one. But as people get promoted and continue to grow their career in this industry and move up the company ladder or whatever you want to call it, there's that shift even from, you know, you brought said the word multi unit. Right. Even to oversee. We've had a lot of um, GMs originally, LOHs that have been promoted into district roles, right? So instead of working day to day in one store, now they're kind of overseeing four to six stores operating. And that's a gigantic shift and very difficult to understand that you're literally responsible. And the the GM, I'll, I'll say, is literally responsible for everything that happens inside those four walls. They have to take, although they don't own the actual restaurant, they have to take ownership of responsibility and accountability for everything that goes inside of that. And running a shift is just a few of those variables, right? Super important. Um, but are you running a shift um, to budget, right? Or do you know how to read a P&L? Do you know what prime cost is? Do you know what income from operations is? Do you know what, um, you know, management fees are? Do you, do you know all of these types of things um, in addition to, do you know how to market your store? Are you using the collateral we send to you to upsell for guests? You know, are you using the data we're getting to make strategic decisions on staffing and uh, the P mix on how to properly um, prep? How are you holding everybody accountable? Sometimes culinary is a little separated too, but they're responsible for culinary, uh, you know, side as well. You know, do you know? Do you know how to fix a? Uh, uh, a leaky toilet or do you call somebody, right? Do you put in a, t- a facilities ticket, um, you know, on and on and on. Um, and I think that shift from, you know, owning to operating a business and knowing you're responsible for everything inside those four walls is challenging. I think it's intimidating. I think it's scary for a lot of uh, people, especially in a green brand by green, I mean, young um, brand as ourselves. And, um, especially those that have been promoted from it, from within our brand and haven't maybe worked in restaurants before, uh, it's 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 a, it's a big shift. And we're very, you know, we have a system for everything. Um, it's our job to minimize that gray area, right? A restaurant's never going to be black and white, but sometimes there can be a lot or a little gray area. And it's our job to facilitate, provide the tools and resources and information necessary for leaderships to make the decision where they feel comfortable um, knowing shifts are going to run smoothly, maybe when they're not on the floor, you know, so they can focus on more of the administrative side, which takes up a large portion, portion, you know, expensing and, and everything's tech now. So, you know, tip cards and we have, you know, what we call in burst cards where money gets loaded and that becomes a store debit card if they need to go out and purchase things. So it's, it's a, it's a lot. And then being a role model, a figure of leadership, you know, are you showing presence and prowess when you're on the floor? Does, when you walk the stores, do you know that person's in charge um, comfortably? And then knowing how to see everything, because no one thing in the restaurant industry is difficult, right? There's just a million variables and how to prioritize those variables, urgent, important, now, delegation, whatever it may be. Um, and that's a difficult trait to teach anybody, um, let alone in our industry. And we like to say, I like to say, when people ask me what my favorite animal would be, or if I had to be an animal to best describe me, I always say an, an owl, right? Because I want people to just step back, observe, and you just take a breath and step back and stand maybe in one spot for 
20 seconds and then go to another area of the restaurant for 20 seconds and just swivel your head like an owl that's up in the tree, right? You'd be amazed at how much, how many things you can see, you know, it provides you coaching opportunities. You might see a light bulb out. You might see a guest, uh, you know, needs a water refill, but if you're just walking the floor on the floor, right? A lot of times you just go through the motions, right? We say lead on the floor. You should be coaching the team on your floor, interacting with the guests on the floor, those types of things. Um, and then that develops that wisdom that you need to provide out to the team. And then they know you're going to see something and they don't want you to see that before they do. So that's going to make them be more motivated to achieve the promise of the brand as well. So, um, yeah, it's a big shift, especially even on the corporate side of, you know, when it was just me and Yvonne, right, to then growing our bus. And now there's probably about 20 of us on the corporate side that, that we oversee um, and, you know, delegating out things that I used to do and having others do it and then hold them accountable, even if, you know, it might not be done the way you want it to or the way you used to do it or whatever it may be. You never will grow individually or personally or professionally if you don't allow those people to make mistakes, because that's the only way they're going to grow and learn into and, and, and that's the only other way you can measure their performance as well. So it's definitely been an adjustment, but um, it, it's been a fun ride. What are the best kept secrets from successful restaurateurs like Stella? What do employees actually want? Is AI coming for your job? Our new newsletter, The Food Runner, answers these questions and more in seven minutes or less. Once a month, you've got a roundup of digestible data, not the boring kind, resources, practical tips, and industry leader insights to learn more quickly. Sign up now at sevenshifts.com and check the link in the description. Now back to the show. And it seems to me like um, the kind of the nice segue, I want to talk a little bit about the core values. And that seems to be one of those things that helps to facilitate all of that consistency and, and some of that leadership. So curious, you know, what, what went into the creation of those core values? And then like, how do you operationalize them? Right. So it's like, it's one thing to just come up with a list of these are the things we stand by. Right. But how do you make sure that that actually makes its way into everyday decision making? Sure. Yeah. A lot of companies have, you know, mission statements, vision statements, whatever you want to call it. Um, so it's probably year two where y- Yvonne, as, as our founder, kind of sat down and kind of thought about what is agave and dry. At that time, it was before we had any other concepts. So you know, why do we do what we do, right? We require all leadership to read Simon Sinek, Start With Why. That's one of our um, books. And we have a whole book club to get into um, later. But, um, you know, why do we do what we do um, and how do we do that? Um, so Yvonne took some time and put some, you know, energy into it. We used to just have the, de- we do, used to just have definitions, right? But it's a lot easier to attach words to those definitions as an easier way to remember or, or coach and, um, so, you know, we came up with love, um, respect, inspire, community, exceed expectations, and epic hospitality. So those six pillars kind of are the framework, the, the foundation of why we do what we do. Um, and any successful group has to actually back up and practice and preach and talk about those um, where they just don't become another poster on the wall. Um, and, you know. Each of those have 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 definitions, of course, um, and, and, and no one is more greater than the other. You need all six kind of seamlessly integrated in order to succeed or get the point across. Right. If you're if you're loving someone but not showing them respect, it's kind of contradictory. So um, and, you know, are you showing yourself respect, the team respect, you know, the community respect, everybody, your, your bosses, your coworkers, your peers and all those are applicable to all situations and require our team to carry a core value card on them as part of their uniform. Um, it just fits in their wallet or the back pocket. And we'll go around and do some audits sometimes. Hey, you got your core value card. And you, yep. And they're always so super excited to um, pull that out of their pocket, which is great. And English on one side and it's in Spanish on the other side, because we have a Latino presence and our culinary team and some of our front of the house um, team as well. So we want to make sure they feel uh, inclusive as well. And if we accomplish or strive for, um, emulating and demonstrating our core values that allows us to fulfill our promise, right? Which is very simple. We promise to deliver an epic experience to our guests, community and team. And sometimes our team thinks, uh, you know, they, sometimes we forget about all three of those and it has to be, you know, cause sometimes what we have to do to the guests maybe doesn't make our team super thrilled or 
um, vice versa. But they have to understand the big picture. And that's a challenge in the restaurant industry, you know, because everyone gets in their little bubble of job description or their store or responsibilities and not stepping back and seeing the big picture of the overall operation business that we've touched on earlier. But everyone can strive to achieve that promise. And lastly, if we have that foundation of core values and we practice and preach and deliver on our promise that allows us to achieve our dream, um, right, in, in, in simplistic terms, our dream is just to make sure that everybody that works for us, we give a a door, an access point, um, the tools, resources needed for them to accomplish their own personal dreams. That's whether, you know, whether that's a career with our brand or us giving the tools and resources that they can take on into another profession or off to college or another degree or whatever it may be. And ultimately that's why we do what we do. We, We don't do it to make money. Obviously you have to be profitable to succeed and to scale, but Profitability is the output, right, of putting in the effort to demonstrate our core values, our promise, and our dream. Do you have one of those cards on you? Um, I have one. Let me see in my <laughs> my bag here. Yeah. Um, so curious. Let's see if I can find it. I used to have a stack. Um, let me see because my wallet's upstairs. I'll send you. I'll send you a copy of it. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, it's pretty pretty cool. It's nice to kind of carry one of those things, uh, you know, that just remind you of, um, you know, purpose or or what you need to be doing. Or um, even if you're not like looking at it all the time, just knowing that it's there, I feel like makes you think about it and um, just drives that home. Well, and when sometimes if there's a team member violating a core value, right, or not demonstrating or whatever, when leadership sits down with that um, team member, you know, hey, get out your core value card. What? Which one of these aren't you following? Uh, I'm um, probably this one. And then then there can be a dialogue and a coaching opportunity um, based off of that, which is great to see. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it gives almost, a, like you said, it's a conversation starter. It's a, you know, sometimes I think if you don't have that, giving people feedback, positive or negative, can be difficult is you know it's like oh it's up to interpretation but if you have that kind of thing it's like no like this is what we follow and for whatever reason you're doing a great job at this one or you know you need to work on this one um we have something similar here at seven shifts a little bit different of a of a type of business right but um, we have our own core values um so uh correct me if any of these numbers are wrong um but i have that you guys sold uh 2.3 million tacos last year which is about 6400 a day um and over a million margaritas so that's quite a lot. Um, as you've scaled, I'm curious, you know, we focus on employees um, a lot here in team management, of course. Um, so what's been the biggest challenge in scaling that quickly, but also maintaining like a happy team? Because it can be a lot of stress, I imagine, um, on the corporate side and, and getting that done and trickling down to the team probably is easy. And, you know, how do you avoid that? Sure. No, um, there's a lot of ways we can go here, but um, the... Anytime you scale, especially a full service restaurant, a scratch kitchen, right? You're always worried about that consistency um, amongst product, right? From not necessarily even from store to store, but from visit to visit. You know, if the same, if I, if a guest dines at our Covington location on Monday and gets two tacos, they come back two weeks from them and get the same two tacos. And if they're not, not the same. That's a challenge, right? And inconsistency is can be the the downfall of any successful brand, whether you know restaurant or group or whatever it may be. So, um, and we try we preach that consistency as much as possible. But as you know, when you're bringing more people on and there's a bigger flow of communication, especially it's something new that comes out or a menu change, whatever it is, how are we ensuring? our team is set up for success. We know we do enough. We know we provide the tools, resources, everything they need. I, I question, I, I'd say probably better than, than most. I would People inside the store still have to take those tools and resources, right, and, and use it to succeed. Um, and sometimes that's a caveat of over-communication and having a lot of oversight from afar where the stores may still view the corporate team or others as a crutch, right? 
instead of operating, um, you know, instead of a, 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 just a support system, right? Or thinking that we will or someone else will be doing some of the things that ultimately they are required um, to do. And that's always a challenge. A lot of times it's hiring the right people, right? Uh, and, and holding them accountable, um, and, which is which is challenging. But the consistency part, right, growing quickly didn't allow us to maybe train external hires um, correctly because, I, like I said, we're very – operationally savvy. We have a lot of systems. We have a lot to learn. We're a scratch kitchen, a scratch bar. Um, so if you come in and you only get two weeks before you had to be thrown into a store, you know, that's probably not enough for them to be comfortable from day one. So there's a lot of learning on the fly and they'll always be learning on the, the fly. Right. So um, setting our teams up for success in a short amount of time, because as you grow um, your internal pipeline, it, it slowly gets, exhausted by exhausted i mean shortened or less people right that can be internally promoted to a position uh, without promoting them to a position where they're not necessarily qualified or have the tools and resources to succeed because once you put someone in that position now there's really not a way out because you can never put them back in the other position because it's a demotion and those things never work out um so we've been we've learned a lot of lessons along the way on on, on that and just because you're a good server bartender what host doesn't mean you're going to make a great um, team lead or a member of leadership or um, maybe because you're a good GM doesn't make certain make sense that you're going to be a good district. Maybe those skill sets. So ad- identifying those skill sets along the way. Um, but ultimately, right. When you, you need people to run shifts, you need people to operate from within the, the, the store. So, Sometimes we have to do that and then provide that that extra oversight. But once you provide extra oversight somewhere, someone else is then getting less oversight. So it's trying to balance that ebb and flow, the teeter totter effect, and making sure everybody has the tools and resources when they uh, need to to um, succeed. And then that you know trusting the process from afar. You know how how can we how can I know sitting here today in the office that our stores are operating efficiently? Right, that's always a big concern. Um, and you can base that. We have a lot of metrics, operational metrics, financial metrics, right? But, you know, you know, and we'll want a negative review comes across the screen. Well, you know, how the hell did this happen? This is, there's should be zero way that this happened to this guest. Like, so what went wrong? And then you're thinking, okay, what else is going wrong at that store or um, with that member of leadership? And then um, trusting the process that they get it. And with the people we've hired to it, like I said, with that oversight on the corporate team, if we trust and respect them to have that same passion and vision and no one works for our brand just for a paycheck, right? That's the output again from what you put into it. Um, so those have been um, some challenges. And then, um, you know, you, we talked about core values on, you know, are those being followed? Is, is our morale up? Is our, do our team still have that buy-in that they did a couple years ago now that we've you know, exponentially grew our, our team or, or, or is a new server getting onboarded properly? Um, and obviously we have all these, these metrics to track these things, but these are always things that are going to your mind. And then how through quick growth or quick scalability, how can you continue to be, proactive in approach instead of um, reactive. Um, you see that a lot in this industry. It's reactive, 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 reactive. This happened. Okay, I got to do this. Instead of I know this is going to happen, let me do these eight, nine, ten things to make sure if this does happen or when it happens, you know, every day you have the plan for plan B, C, and D in our industry. Someone's going to call off sick. There's going to be some crazy thing that happens. Are you prepared to handle these situations? And then are we prepared to handle big situations, right? Is, is someone going to, um, you know, randomly is a guest going to slip and fall and sue us, right? Um, what do we do in these situations to mitigate those types of things? Because as you grow, people think, oh, money, 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 money. Well, the restaurant industry margins are still the same and even thinner now with inflation and, and costs going up, which is crazy, right? You know, making, you know, one cent off every dollar, um, sometimes doesn't click like that. So that kind of goes back to the operating a business side of thing is understanding, okay, you might've done 
$10,000 today, great day. But if you were over labor 15%, right, um, instead of, quote, unquote, bringing just $1,000 to the bottom line, maybe you only bought brought 300 or maybe you ran out of cheese and had to go to the store and pay double the cheese. And then you lost the opportunity cost of the time in the restaurant. So what went wrong there? That means you weren't interacting with guests on the floor because you were running to a grocery store to get something, right? So all of these things that every restaurant group deals with and um, trying to mitigate and minimize um, the, the opportunity for um, disadherence to what we want to do. Absolutely. There's a lot that goes into it. <laughs> So, oh yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> um, I, I imagine though, uh, and I know this, uh, you go a little off script uh, before we wrap up the internal promotions, um, and looking at that as you grow, um, it seems to be a strategy for you guys to, to look internally and provide those career paths. And, um, is that something that you guys are looking to do? Or I guess, is it something that you prioritize? Cause it seems like you do and, and what goes into that and what are the advantages of it? Yeah, of course. And, and, Kind of goes back to our core values, right? Our, our dream, right? Providing those opportunities, um, but setting the team up for success. The good thing about internally, right? People have worked with you X amount of time, whether that's you know months or whatever. You can you can gauge their buy-in. You can gauge if they're a good person. You can gauge if they have potential to develop into an all-star, all-star or a leader. You can tell if people look up to this person. Um, so that kind of eliminates a lot of the unknowns from maybe an external hire. Everyone can interview good these days. Um, references, you're limited on what questions you can ask. Um, so, but we have noticed pros and cons to both, right? Um, the internal people, like I mentioned, we don't want to promote them too quickly. So we're, we're, we're working Katie, our chief people officer, who we brought on just over a year ago, phenomenal. Um, we're working together on a plan called, it's called Road to Ready, right? Um, so if you are a server and you want to become a member of leadership because you love this brand, you see the growth opportunities, you know what it stands for, you see a career in this industry, you know exactly what steps you need to accomplish and, and in what time frame to be eligible to be a ETL, which is our Epic Team Lead, which is our entry-level hourly position. Um, and then if you get that position, you know exactly what you need to do to become a dining room manager, which is our entry level store salary position. So developing that, because as we've grown quickly, right, some people have been put into roles after a few months, just in a previous position and other people see that within the brand and sometimes assume, well, this person did it in two months. I should be able to do it in two months. And then it makes that it creates that gray area that we mentioned. So in that course of um, conversation, if you say, well, we don't think you're ready to them, that can be seen as a, they don't believe in me type of thing. And that's not the case at all. Right. We want to set you up for succeed because as we grow, we need people in leadership positions that can operate with less and less oversight um, because the corporate bus always grows at a much smaller percentage than, you know, new openings in theory. I mean, that's kind of the, the, the model. Um, now the external, right. We have a lot of uh, recent ones that have came on with great experience, great previous restaurant groups they've worked for. Um, they're eager. They love the brand, but it's difficult, right. When you've been doing something a long time to kind of shut off and learn um, the new way of doing things or the agave way or the Epic brands way of doing things. And sometimes they don't agree or not, you know, but we, we we're open to that feedback, but um, so they have the basics of running a shift that we've talked about or restaurant one oh one, the management side. Um, then it's transitioning them into the leadership side of the equation and developing them where they're comfortable also knowing all the systems in a short period of time, as opposed to those that have been internally promoted or we want to promote internally, they've been doing the systems for a long period of time. Um, and as you're a scalable brand, what it was, if, you, if you're not growing or evolving or changing, right, you're dying quote, right? So um, our brand is always trying to, trying to tr stay on trend, create trends. Um, you know, we had birria tacos two years before it was a, it's a thing. Now it's a thing everywhere. And it's our number one seller by far. Um, 
and, and, and just do things like that. But once again, as you're constantly changing or evolving, those changes and evolution have to be communicated down, bought in to provide that consistent product that can make or break you. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's a great place to kind of wrap things up. I'm curious, um, you know, I know you have an opening coming up soon, but what does the rest of the year look like for, uh, for you and, um, and for the Epic Brands Group? Yeah. Yeah. So like I said, we just opened our second location in greater Cleveland, um, which is a great market. And we have one more in the books, one more agave and rye in the books. And it's taken, geez, right. Five years, right. To get a systematic documented approach, right. For successful scalable business. So we eventually want to scale our steakhouse and open some new concepts, like I mentioned, but that shift from one to two, especially at a steakhouse, the consistency even more important at that higher price point. So we're going to work on maybe developing this year some more systematic approaches. What what does a duplicatable SOB look like and how can we um, do those types of things and then evaluate, you know, with our fast growth, we haven't really had a time to sit back. Roundtables, collaborative communication on what does the next year look like? I mean, and that's all this year. Election years are always crazy in our industry. The, the weather is out of whack nowadays and the economy, um, you know, we have to make sure we're financially stable for what we want to do, right? We want to, we want to launch a loyalty program later this year, right? We've been in contact with um, a bunch of providers. We want to do a, a lot of things. We want to offer more benefits to our team. We want to redo our bonus program, our operational metrics. So there's a lot of these things, but everything costs money um, or time and how to use the best of our resources and time to succeed those. So we want to get Hamilton, which is on the outs- outskirts of Cincinnati, um, open probably in July. And that'll give us the last half of the year to kind of um, strip- strategize for the future, and which we're super, super excited about. Awesome. Well, Chris, I appreciate you coming on today. Um, Thanks for sharing all your expertise and and learnings with our with our audience. And thank you so much. Yeah, anytime. Much appreciated. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the pre shift podcast. If you enjoyed it, please leave a review and share it with one of your friends to help our show grow. We could not do it without your support. As always, I would love to hear what you think. You can email me at dj at sevenshifts.com. I look forward to hearing from you until next time.